Fleming Rutledge's book, The Crucifixion, is one of the best theology books I've read in the last oh, 10 years. She's a, uh, a theologian, but also well-known in the Episcopal tradition as a preacher. I like how her book is, is full of illumination for the mind, but it also can preach. There are some books of theology you read and you say, well, that's interesting, but I mean, I'd never use that in a homiletic setting. Her book you could really use, and you can tell it's from the, the pen of a thinker and a preacher. There's so much of interest in it. I just want to, for the sake of this video, I'll talk about a couple of things. I hope we do some more videos down the line about it. It's that rich a book. The first theme, and it kind of haunts the whole text, is the sheer strangeness of the cross. She wants to defamiliarize the cross. She wants to de-domesticate the cross. So we see it in all of its sort of awful power. She begins with a text from uh, Paul, Romans 1.16, where Paul says, and we sort of take it for granted, we've heard it so often, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's, you know, the power to save both Jews and Gentiles. But that opening phrase, the more you think about it, the stranger it becomes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, she says, you know, the, the Buddha uh, offering his teaching might expect people not to agree with it. But would the Buddha ever say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of what I'm, well, I mean, why would you be ashamed of it? Or Muhammad, I mean, maybe he knew people wouldn't accept it, some. But would he ever say, you know, I'm not ashamed of the, of the Quran? Well, no, I mean, Confucius wouldn't say that about his teaching. Why in the world would Paul have to sort of make this apology? You know, hey, hey, you know, but I, I'm not ashamed. It's because he's declaring something that at the time would have struck people as supremely strange that you would associate euangelion, right, good news, with the cross, with someone who had been crucified, that was an anomaly to the extreme in the ancient world. And that's why he has to say, hey, I'm not ashamed of it, because you'd expect he would be. That's the point. Anyone speaking of the cross is speaking of the most shameful thing you could imagine. So Rutledge insists upon this, I think, quite correctly. It's not enough to say, that Jesus died. You know, so he died for our sins. Sure. That's not enough. Nor is it enough to say, oh, he was put to death you know, by powerful and wicked people. That's not enough. He accepted, Paul says, even death. Death on a cross. Paul says, furthermore, I preach one thing, Christ and him crucified. Not just I preach one thing, Christ. Okay, I get that but Christ and him crucified. The weirdness of the cross belongs to the very heart of the gospel, and that should give us pause. Again, why? Why? Well, our problem is that we've so domesticated the cross. So it's up on our walls as a decoration. We wear it as jewelry on our necks. We're so used to seeing it, we, we say, oh yeah, that's a lovely religious symbol. <laughs> Go back to Paul's time. Go back to the first century cross, or better, someone dying on a cross, was about the worst, ugliest, most dehumanizing and shameful thing you could imagine. So when someone was crucified, first of all, they were stripped naked. So we see images of Jesus with the loincloth. Well, that's really a historical. I mean, he would have been naked on the cross. So humiliated right away, utterly exposed in the most shameful way, especially for a Jew, mind you affixed to this um, you know, cross beam, which was then placed in, a, in an upright beam. The person was nailed or sometimes tied to this uh, device and then allowed to hang there. And the, the great torture, they say, of the cross was this very slow process of asphyxiation. So as you're trying to breathe, you have to literally rock up and down on your wounded wrists and wounded feet. So every of those moves, excruciatingly painful, and again, that word excruciate from the cross. So our word for paradigmatic pain comes from the cross, excruciating pain. But you're slowly suffocating. Your own bodies become your enemy because you can't get your, your breath. People on the cross would last hours and hours and hours, sometimes days and days. Imagine being in this state, of course, not fed, not, not uh, hydrated in any way, 
allowed basically to torture yourself to death on this horrific instrument. More to it, when you die, your body was typically left on the cross. So it could be picked over by the, by the birds of the air and the, and the scavenging animals. The point here is, it, it, it was just, it, it was utterly dehumanizing. The way you treat an insect or, or, or a very uh, uh, objectionable animal. That's the level you've been uh, reduced to. Cicero referred to it simply and tellingly as the sumum supplicium, the, the, the limit case of punishment, the worst kind of punishment. That's what you people are talking about? So imagine the first hearers of the good news. I preach one thing, Christ and him crucified. What, what in the world are you talking about? The point is, only when we get this sort of horrific quality of the cross do we begin to understand its power and why Paul declared it precisely as power. And this conduces now to the second point that Rutledge makes and I want to emphasize, which is the seriousness of sin. Now, this is a big problem in our time. It's a big problem in our time. I'm okay, you're okay, I'm beautiful in every way, my will triumphs over everything, I am what I want to be, don't tell me I've done anything wrong. All of that is in our culture, right? Which does away with, uh, with the weight of sin. And press it another way, too. She comments that we have the tendency, in the wake of terrible evil, let's say one of these school shootings, you know, is right away... Look, all you got to do is offer a blithe word of forgiveness. So, do you forgive those who, who killed your friends? Just, just go ahead and forgive them. As though that's enough. As, as though that's enough to address the weight of sin. She makes the point, and it's absolutely right, that in the Bible, it's not so much sins, the particular bad things we do, but sin as a condition that we're in. It's like a disease. It's like an addiction. More than the, than the things that I do, it's the state that has gripped me. And don't we know it? Think of, you know, the, the tragedies happening all over the world. How, how do I respond to that? Whether it's a, it's a shooter going into a nightclub, whether it's someone who's blowing up an airport, whether it's someone shooting up a high school. Well, now what do you do? Now solve that problem. Oh, a word of forgiveness or let's go in there and and we'll get some better police uh, protection. I mean, give me a break. Th these things are expressive of a dysfunction so fundamental that we on our own can't handle it. What do we need? We need something to address this problem from outside the human condition. This can't be solved politically, socially, psychologically, by our good efforts. No, no. Something has to come from the outside and, and something awful that matches the awfulness of the condition that we're in. Now, see what she's doing, and, and I'll say more about it in future videos because it's too much to, to cover, but now gesturing toward people like St. Anselm, right? what has to happen for sin to be addressed? but the sacrifice of the Son of God. The Son of God moving into the limits of our own dysfunction, taking upon himself the limit case of the awfulness of sin. Do you see now the point that the awfulness of the cross is a counterweight. It's the only legitimate counterweight to the awfulness of sin. And anything less than that is not taking sin with requisite seriousness. I think those are both extremely important points as we begin now to understand the meaning of Christ's cross.